Great. So welcome to today's webinar, Wildlife Management on the Farm. I'm Shannon Dill. I'm with University of Maryland Extension, and I work with the Mid-Atlantic Women in Agriculture Network. Before we start today, I'd like to thank our sponsors of the Mid-Atlantic Women in Ag program, as well as our collaborators. So we have two left for this year. We have them on the second and fourth Wednesday of each month. And so we are busy planning for our 2022 schedule, which I can't believe already. So the blue link there is where you will find archived uh, recordings of all of our webinars, as well as check back because we'll be scheduling them through at least the first six months of 2022. So with that, I'm gonna now turn it over to Luke. He's going to do a great introduction um, of his work with wildlife management on the farm with University of Maryland Extension. Thank you, Shannon. Can everybody hear me okay? That sounds good. Um, great. Um, first off, I'm going to pop into the chat box a evaluation link. Um, so you can have that ready. Um, and you can provide any constructive feedback or comments as we're going through. Um, let me go ahead and get my screen share. To share. Let's get the presentation started. And flip that around. Okay, it's good. All right, thank you. Um, well, welcome everybody. Uh, it's, it's great to be here. Thank you, Shannon, for inviting me. Um, so, uh, Shannon, do you have those uh, the polls questions ready? Yes, I will open those up. So we have a couple of questions. I always like to get a feel for what the audience is interested in, and um, it's my first time using uh, one of these polls on a. WebEx. So, um, but the first question is, what are you, what are you interested in? What are you more interested in attracting wildlife and bringing them in or um, mitigating? And that's supposed to be mitigating wildlife damage, so like controlling damage is item B there. So that's what mitigating wildlife is. Um, so like how to manage uh, deer damage in your crops or other things like that. Um, and the second question is, what kind of wildlife are you most interested in? And we have a a few different types um, there, so uh, I think you can maybe pick more than one. Actually, I'm going to fill out the survey myself. Let's see if I can pick more than one. Now you can only pick one of the which type are you most interested in. So, mm -hmm. okay. big game animals, upland game, non-game waterfowl, reptiles, and amphibians, varmints like groundhogs and things like that. So, I'm going to go ahead and submit mine. And just test it. And um, we'll let this go for another couple. Longer. Can you see how many people have responded, Shannon? Yes. So we've got um, twelve have finished. Two are in okay. progress. Cool. Give a couple more seconds for those two. This is to get a feel for for the audience, and I can. I'm covering both of these a lot of these different topics here today, but it's uh, I can kind of lean one way or the other. Go focus a little bit. So you got the results. You want to go ahead and read off what we got so far? Sure. So we have eight that are interested, or 42% are interested in attracting wildlife, and five are interested in mitigating wildlife. And we are pretty split on the types of animals. And, and sorry, that poll didn't allow for multiple. We, we tried to get it to work that way. Um, but we had, um, it's a tie with big game, upland game, and varmints. Oh, all right, cool. Well, it works out well because, uh, well, thank you, Shannon, and thanks mm -hmm. everybody for responding. It works out pretty well. I will, I'm covering all these materials. It's, it's great, we're gonna cover damage and attraction. Uh, for the deer item, we're gonna cover a little bit more on damage, but I can try and emphasize, spend, spend a little bit more time on the attraction because it sounds like that's of interest to people. So, um, and we're going to cover both big game and some upland game, uh, in particular grassland birds. So I, I titled this fur and feathers on the farm. Um, so hopefully this is uh, interesting for all of you. And again, you have that link for feedback. Feel free to give me comments and stuff. 
So let's get going and get started. It's the slide. There we go. There's the outline. We're going to cover these two items. So we'll start with deer um, and deer management. I like to give a bit of an overview of some deer habitat and biology issues. And then we'll talk about the damage issues, which is a common um, issue, and, and talk about integrated pest management, um, which really covers uh, four main themes uh, for how to manage deer. And uh, it, the concept of integrated pest management is that you might need some of these at different times, depending on your situation, and using them all together gives you a lot of options for, for managing the problem. So uh, I'll start briefly with some deer biology. Um, this is a figure from camera trap activity uh, on actually black-tailed deer out in California, but white-tailed deer have very similar uh, patterns. But this is the hour of the day, and the, the humps that you see there are the level, uh, the number of photos that were taken of deer during a time of the day. So you have, uh, you know, this bimodal, this two humped pattern of activity um, in the morning hours and in the evening hours. That's when, and that we call that crepuscular activity uh, when animals have that sort of morning and evening activity. Um, these different colors actually signify also different age classes or, or different genders or often or points and sizes of antlers on males. Um, so you see there, as you go into more mature animals, there's fewer of them in these three and four point uh, bucks, and they also tend to be more nocturnal and be uh, active at night um, and harder to see. Um, another aspect I, I always like to point out um, with deer biology is that is there's a real um, change in energy needs for deer as the, through the calendar year. Um, this is a, image of energy requirements for uh, pregnant and lactating um, animals, ungulates, and the brown is a, is a sort of baseline maintenance energy requirements that they need to survive. But when they're pregnant, and especially when they're lactating, the energy requirements really peak um, in that blue area between mid-May and, and into June and July and August. Um, I have really noticed that this is also a time for a lot of damage when you have freshly planted crops. There's a lot of uh, succulent vegetation out there so that they coincide really this perfect storm of deer needing a lot more, almost double the energy requirements. And we're also agricultural uh, farmers are trying to um, also put in crops that are highly palatable so in, in most cases. So something to think about on the calendar when you, when you see this. And also this pertains to the females um, and doe management will be a piece um, that plays into this. How much do doe eat? Do deer eat? It's approximately six to eight percent of their body weight a day. That tends to be six to 12 pounds of green forage a day. That's a whole lot. If you flip six pounds of forage and put it in a bag, it's a, it's a quite uh, substantial amount. So just to but in the context that there's a sort of um, vacuum effect that, that deer can have on um, uh, small scales and relatively quickly. Another concept I, I like to just touch on for the biology before we delve into management is uh, the idea of carrying capacity. Uh, it's defined as a maximum population size of a species that can be sustained in a specific environment. Um, I'm a visual person and I like to provide graphs to, for people to think about what does this mean and how does this play into how populations change and differ. And this figure right here is what uh, biologists will call a logistic um, S-shaped growth curve. And this is a model of how a lot of wildlife populations change over time, where um, as the population um, reaches this uh, concept of carrying capacity, where it's the maximum population that an environment can support, and that's this red dashed line, the growth of the population stops. You have births and deaths equal out. Um, either animals will starve to death, and so they just can't support anymore. The population can't grow anymore. Um, in the middle is this area of fast growth. So you have actually, when you have a population that's, say, half of the carrying capacity in theory, so if your farm can support 100 deer, um, and you actually call the population back to 50 deer, you're actually going to have a higher growth rate and more production of new animals um, 
with that lower current, that lower population because there's plenty of food out. All the deer get fat. They all have twins and they have, they're lactating well and there's a lot of survival. And so you can have a faster growth rate. So this is also something, just background to, to plug in for us to think about as we um, move into some of these damage issues and attraction issues and, and managing poor deer. Um, one thing that happens in reality, of course, that's the ideal model. In reality, you have these situations where populations can jump over the uh, over the line and overshoot the carrying capacity, and then you can have uh, various kinds of diebacks, disease, and other things that drop the population back down. And you have this sort of movement um, around that carrying capacity line. Here's a. Uh, picture at the Wide Research and Education Center where I'm based. Um, we've got a study looking at um, forage soybeans uh, to see whether we can mitigate uh, crop damage by deer. And here we have uh, one caught in the act. Um, bucks are larger bodied animals, and so they do eat comparatively more. Um, and it's a funny picture because you have this sort of very uh, disappearing uh, soybean leaves right into his mouth. Um, I'd like to show some pictures to give examples of what is going on in certain places of Maryland. Here's some imagery of a cornfield that is just, um, has always caused this farmer a lot of trouble. It is the sort of deer entry point into his fields. And you can see you have uh, several acres that are just completely destroyed here. And this movement of deer into the corn um, and these paths and continuing to eat their way into the, the cornfields. Here's another example of some of the uh, more extreme damage we've seen on some farms where this is a soybean exclosure and you can see that the deer have really um, taken out all the soybeans around uh, this this area. Even in places where it's not so obvious, like this picture right here are dried soybeans um, here at the Y and it, you can tell that the it's not super obvious here in this picture, but there's a shortening effect on on the soybeans as you get closer to that grass edge on the right. And so it looks like, yeah, maybe there's deer grazing, uh, maybe about 15 feet into there. And after that, it looks like it kind of evens out. However, whenever you get onto a combine with the yield monitor, this is the yield monitor of that field. And you can see that uh, the red is the lower yielding portions of the field. And you actually have this damage extending much further into the field than you would expect and that, than you see just on a glance on foot. So um, certainly uh, there can be, in this field, we had pretty substantial losses. If the whole field was in that dark green color, uh, we would have had 30% more, more gains in that field, more yields. A couple more images just to describe what we have here. Um, these are a couple of farms. We are working uh, at the, on with, uh, with the Maryland Soybean Board to explore whether forage soybeans might be a, a diversion crop um, for a more conventional crops. So in this field on the left, there is a white strip around the field that was planted in forage soybeans as a kind of catch crop or a biological fence or a diversion to keep deer out of the main cash crop in the corn in the center. Um, they did a number on it and they actually ate almost all of that. That white strip is, is pretty much bare areas where they uh, have gone through and eaten soybean, the forage soybeans. Uh, this farmer um, says it's difficult to quantify, but and he, and he, but he, and he actually tracks his numbers quite well. He says, I won't be able to quantify it, but I tell you, this is working. Uh, I do, this costs me less than all these other things. I would do this again in a heartbeat. So anecdotally, we have some evidence there. We're collecting more data to, to, to get this out, um, to see if we can get numbers on this. This field on the right, uh, uh, is another high damage field. It's surrounded by a thousand acres of forest. Uh, so this this farmer has 70, 70 deer in his farm uh, in the night and sometimes. And you can see these the small green dot on the bottom right. If you can see my cursor circling it there, that is one of these exclosures where you can see uh, that deer. This field will grow soybeans. They're just actually eaten out. This isn't soil issues. Uh, this is actually deer damage up here on the top. This little panhandle up here. Is also a little dot, a little green dot where you have soybeans at an exclosure, uh, showing that they will grow there and they're just grazed out. So, um, the first leg in our integrated pest management approach is vegetation management. Um, 
on the the food pyramid, uh, the trophic pyramid for wildlife and all life on the planet. Um, the baseline that we have here that drives everything is the plants. It takes the energy from the sun and it feeds the rest of uh, life on the planet. So vegetation is just really critically important and I always like to start with that. Um, here's a picture of some of those forage soybeans um, that we're working with the, with the Maryland Soybean Board. They do have some promise. They certainly are preferred. Here's a picture of it. Um, it is side by side with conventional soybeans. It does appear to be anecdotally certainly preferred uh, forage compared to uh, the other soybean varieties. So one of the challenges we have is they tend to be later maturing varieties, um, but we are trying to find earlier maturing varieties that will work um, in a production system. Here's an image of some of the different uh, of the preferences. The big fellow is the variety that we are we have found that appears to be most pre preferred, and it's um, you can see this sort of deer targeting this these strips. The big fellow, this replicated experiment here. But we do have a lot of uh, what we call heterogeneity or a lot of variation in how deer behave, especially when it comes to cover and space. So what's driving it? It seems like this big fellow does have higher crude protein and higher moisture content, and lower dry matter. Not really significant, but it does seem to be enough to really be driving of deer preferences. So uh, that's a little research study we got going on. I wanted to touch on. Uh, since some of you are interested in attracting deer, I'm glad I put this slide in here. Um, there are three main categories of, uh, of forages you can plant to attract deer. Again, this can work also to divert deer from your crops. Um, but the first main category are the cool season perennials. That's clovers, alfalfa, chicory. Uh, clovers are a great option. They, they grow pretty well, pretty easily. Then you have uh, cool season annuals, uh, such as oats, wheat, or winter pea. Here on this picture on the right, you have a seed mix of, uh, I believe that is, oh, we have believe that is oats in there, which is those grassy looking uh, taller uh, uh, vegetation coming up. The red flowers are the is crimson clover, and this other leafy broadleaf plant is uh, winter pea, Austrian winter pea, which is in our study last year found to be one of the most preferred, uh, the most obviously preferred forage um, in the spring. So you have these cool season plants that you plant in the fall in August, September, um, and they will produce growth up until now, even right now, and they will oftentimes carry through good forage up into some up into early summer when they will either die back or start to be outcompeted by warm season plants. So there's the, the third category we have here is these warm season uh, varieties. Uh, soybean is a, is a great plant, very highly preferred, high protein content. We also have corn. Uh, cow peas, American joint veg, a few other options uh, for planting. Um, there's a lot that goes into putting in food plots. There's a lot that goes into farming. Um, so um, there's some great guides out there. Um, Craig Harper at the University of Tennessee has come up with a, a very um, substantial guide for wildlife food plots. And we'll go through all the different aspects and things to think about with soil pH, timing of planting, weed control and other aspects like that. So I, I really would recommend if you want to dig into this, this is a great resource. So we'll touch briefly on fencing, then we'll hit repellents and population management. I'm going to try and go through this a little bit faster so we can have time for questions and we can also hit the upland game birds. Uh, so fencing. Uh, deer, if you have a six to eight foot fence, eight foot is, is really would be the great eight or nine foot, you'll have 100% coverage. Um, they found about eight foot generally deer will, will not jump them. They can get through it, but it's such a deterrent. Unless there's something really pushing those deer, uh, maybe scaring them or pushing them, they generally won't cross a deer that tall. There's a few different options. You have plastic mesh, which uh, will work. Uh, it might require more maintenance. It might uh, uh, get torn down uh, more easily, but it's a le least expensive option to get started with. And then move into more substantial fencing like woven wire fences like this one at eight feet high. Uh, this is very expensive. Uh, I believe some estimates put it around, and don't quote me on this, but I think it puts it around $10 a foot. That varies a lot depending on whether you have shrubs, trees, 
topography and a lot of other factors, um, local cost of labor and things like that. But these fences are highly effective. Make sure you close your gates um, or put in cow guards to also keep them from going in your entryways. Um, uh, substantial investment. I've done some back of the envelope calculations and unfortunately with agronomic crops, um, if you estimate the life of these fences to be about 20 years, did some cost benefit analyses and it turns out um, it, the fence pays for itself and improved crop yields in about 20 years. So it's a bit of a break even proposition again, not based on some back of the envelope calculations. It's just very expensive to put in and to justify this with standard agri agronomic crops. If you have higher value crops, um, uh, like horticultural aspects, then this can also can start to make more sense if you're operating a nursery or something. Uh, another option is electric fences. Uh, the key to getting these to work, these are is are more maintenance. Um, one of the keys is to train the deer on the fences for a few days or weeks in advance. You put peanut butter or other attractants on the metal so the deer will come up and actually lick that and get a little zap and then they will realize that they don't want to go anywhere near that. Um, these small fences will work Deer can get over them, they can get tangled up in them, they require maintenance. Um, another option that's a, a bit more complicated but will work more effectively um, is this two tiered um, aspect of an electric fence where deer have poor depth perception. So they can't quite tell when they have this separated uh, lines where the fence starts, where it ends, and exactly how high it is, and they just don't like to to jump over this. So they have a harder time with this kind of a fence setup. It's very effective. Again, it takes more space out of your, your production area, but it is it's pretty effective. Clemson University has a great publication out describing this and the links on the bottom. Propellants can work. Um, again, it depends on the circumstances that you have. Generally, I know I've heard some farmers say they're very expensive. We have a, a fact sheet up on uh, with Older prices, these prices need to be updated, so you want to check check current pricing on this. But um, here's a variety of different options that were that were looked at, and there's information for this. It tends to work better with these five. There's five different um, aspects noted on this uh, this uh, publication. You have lower deer pressure or smaller acreage. Um, you, ha you don't have your neighbors using it, and there's alternative food sources available. So these are the types of places where repellents can be most effective. Here's some results uh, from a study out of Arkansas um, working using gardening plants. Actually, this is for, I believe, on pansies. Uh, but they found that the uh, repellents worked really great um, so about for about three to four weeks. And about that 30-day mark, they started to wear off, 20 to 30-day mark. And you have varying, they still reduce damage compared to no repellent, which is the gray on the bottom but they started to sustain more damage after, after two to three weeks. So it's something that has to be redone. Um, and, and again, it can be expensive. Um, something that, some options for people to think about given a particular situation. Dogs, another option, and they can be repellent. You can put underground electric fences on, up. Um, they really do need to be out at night. Um, and depending on your topography, you could get uh, up to 20 to 30 acres of protection if your animals are out there especially if it's a, a wide open flat area uh, with higher visibility and ease of access. Um, finally, we'll touch a bit on population management. Um, and I'll, this also goes to some of that attracting wildlife and sort of building a, a more an improved, uh, improved quality of hunt. So some people, uh, and I think there's a real, uh, a real opportunity here to reduce damage while also improving the quality of the hunting on one's property. Um, so the idea is uh, that there's two main concepts that I'd like to talk about with these. One is the concept of age structure. The second is buck to doe ratio. Um, here's that uh, logistic growth curve again, and you can see what I've talked about earlier is you could have, uh, you can lower your deer population, have lower densities in this sort of middle zone and have faster growth, they're going to have more opportunities to harvest because you're actually growing more deer every year um, uh, and can take more off the property. 
Um, the other aspect is age structure. And um, one of the biggest things that can help produce, uh, improve, uh, especially trophy hunting uh, for, for bucks, which is a, a highly sought after aspect of deer management, is to allow your animals to mature, ideally to four and a half or five, five and a half or plus years. And there's some great resources up. Here's a, here's a nice uh, uh, description showing how to age deer. And ideally, if you can pass on your deer and allow them to grow to mature animals, they will hit their, um, their physical peak. And there's a lot of other benefits to this as well. Um, you have more competition for mating. There are tend to be uh, more uh, condensed fawning schedules because there's enough bucks to breed all the does in the population if you have um, more mature bucks and that can help with reducing losses from predation and other things. So age structure is an important part of, of thinking about managing your deer and improving your harvest. The other aspect is buck to doe ratios. Um, it's very common that you'll see you have three or more does for every buck. Oftentimes you might see 10 or 12 or 20 does for every buck you might see. Now, it's not that the bucks aren't there. They're, they're there, they're just hiding out. They don't have the same types of behaviors of does. Um, there is a self-correcting aspect to the sex ratios. So um, where they do tend to be born about 50-50 between males and females. So even if you harvest a lot of males, as they have a new set of fawns, that, um, that sex ratio starts to even. But bucks and male fawns uh, tend to die at higher rates than females. They have higher energetic needs. So a lot of the fawns will starve um, more than female fawns will. And so you tend to also have this sort of natural mortality in addition to hunting that also will often target bucks as well. Um, so if you can improve this buck to doe ratio to one buck for every two does or even one buck for every doe, which is it's pretty challenging to do. Um, you can get some improved and oftentimes desirable social behaviors in these in the deer population um, where you can see bucks competing for does and um, fighting and uh, trying to get after uh, to breed does, you know, grunting. And, and also I mentioned this sort of concentrated fawning season, which can help reduce losses from predation. Here in Maryland, if you uh, want to manage your deer population, there's a lot. If you have deer damage, there are pretty liberal deer management per permits available. This little QR code here at the bottom right, you can scan this, pull it up on your phone, and uh, you can see it on your picture. And um, it'll take you to the link where you can have the rules and learn about it. But it allows antlerless harvest year-round. Um, the DNR, if you demonstrate damage, the DNR is pretty liberal in providing these permits to remove deer, which can also, again, help um, take to help to change that buck to doe ratio and improve uh, more bucks in your population, which is often kind of why. So in conclusions, uh, just briefly, there's a lot of different things you can do to try and manage deer, uh, depending on the size of your property, your topography, the value of your crops that you're growing. Um, any of these things can work for you. Um, and there's a lot of resources out there for uh, for hunting and learning how to hunt and how to do this. So um, to answer questions on anything I might not have covered there. Um, and now I want to shift gears and move into the second part of our um, of the talk, which is these upland grasslands and these upland game birds. Uh, in particular, the focus on one of our species that is most disappearing, which is fortunately the bobwhite quail. Um, it's iconic game species across most of Eastern North America and has really been undergoing losses across its entire range. Uh, here's an image of some of these, these grasslands that, where some of the last populations here in the Eastern Shore of Maryland reside, just to give you a feel for the kind of habitat that they like and need. Um, I mentioned the uh, Maryland, the bird declines and uh, Bob, the Northern Bob White tops the list in terms of all bird species that are declining across the state of Maryland. Uh, these are trends over the last uh, 40, 50 years or so. Um, and uh, so 
And this graph, and I just produced this recently, so it's a trend from 1966 to 2019. All the species, all those birds with the green bars, and this is percent decline per year on average. All those birds with the green bars are grassland or early succession or young forest um, habitat species. Uh, the blues are generalists. They might like forests, woodlands, or wetlands. And the yellow are like this brushy habitat, also early succession kind of habitat. So um, in Maryland, nine of the top 10 of the top 10 declining birds are uh, required grassland and early succession habitat. So I see this as a real need um, to, to work on and think about and uh, provide information for people if they'd like to try to see a return to some of these species. I know a lot of farmers uh, really lament the loss of some of these uh, popular game birds. Uh, they're popular with hunters and they're nice to see around and, and really it's kind of a shame to see them going away. So here's a picture of those Bob White quail. Um, seems as though the loss of some of these warm season grasslands, uh, the changes in practices where you have shrubby cover areas, um, people like oftentimes to see things clean and so the mowing of any brambles and brushy areas uh, and hedgerows um, can really impact uh, these birds they really need that kind of habitat um, here's a map of some of the remaining pockets here on the eastern shore of maryland now this isn't uh, this isn't a scientific map but it gives us a sense of where they are this is based on sightings on citizen science apps um, and we know there are some populations that are in some of these areas, um, but they are, um, you know, in, in these bluer areas, um, probably very rare to see or, or vagrants. They're just dispersing individuals that you might see from time to time. Um, so this is where, where birds are still left and uh, where we are targeting trying to improve habitat to keep these birds from disappearing. Um, they've almost entirely disappeared off the Southern Maryland uh, which used to be a high, uh, a, a consider the breadbasket of Bob White quail. So uh, there's only possibly just a couple populations left in all of Southern Maryland and all the rest of Maryland. So Eastern Shore is uh, one of the last strongholds. So uh, trying to keep them from blinking out on us. There's a lot of other bird species that are in decline. This is the Eastern Meadowlark, grasshopper sparrows, prairie warblers. And uh, so this, these types of habitats can provide a lot of benefits to other birds. Um, I'll talk briefly on the quail biology and habitat. There's three main things that you need for quail habitat. And this is why these birds are pretty tricky to manage for and possibly part of why they are in such decline. Um, they need this mixture of nesting habitat, brooding habitat where their young are born and raised, and then escape so the nesting habitat, they really prefer these native warm season grasses, these bunch grasses here on the bottom right. Uh, you have a picture of, of a bob white nest in one of these bunch grasses here in, in New Jersey. Um, and so you need to provide these sort of habitats where they, they're ground nesting birds and they will, they will uh, put their little nests in there. So you need that for the population to be able to breathe and survive. The brooding habitat, um, they estimate this is like a, an ideal kind of rough mix of the types of habitat you need in, a, in about a 50 acre area because the birds don't tend to move a lot more than 70 foot from escape cover birds. So having all these different pieces in a, in a relatively small area are really important. Uh, the brooding habitat are the areas where you can have annual weeds, and legumes, and even crops. Uh, they have a lot of bare ground. These birds are walking around on the ground and they need to be able to actually peck around in the dirt and move. Um, our cool season grasses don't really allow for that. So the warm season grasses have, have more space in between them and that's really what is uh, important in that brooding habitat. So finding, so re reducing uh, the competition with cool season grasses, allowing a lot of bare ground. Finally, the escape cover is really key, especially we have very healthy hawk populations and they can really do a number on quail as well. So they need to be able to get into shrubby areas, brambles, eastern red cedars, some of those um, sort of brushy species uh, in the hedgerows that they can get away from predators.
So this, uh, here's a picture of that sort of uh, where one of these, this is at the Nanticoke Wildlife Management Area where there's still a remaining a few coveys of, of quail left. Um, and you have these eastern red cedars, which are here out in the distance, and they provide a lot of good, good cover in the distance. The nesting habitat is here, and um, you have a, there's also areas that they disc regularly to keep that bare space open for the, the birds to forage. The other challenge, I think, with quail habitat is the management piece, and um, they need to be maintained in our area that we have relatively good soils, we have a lot of moisture, and if these areas are left alone, they will quickly become forests. Um, and that's what's happened in a lot of the of the state. And so there is this need to maintain this habitat through disking or pre prescribed fire if you're able to do these things. Um, generally, you'll do these on a three-year rotation, so you'll disk one area, a third of the area that you're managing for the, for the quail, and sort of do a rotation every third year, you'll do a third of the area to keep the woodies out and woody vegetation and small trees and saplings from growing up in there. Mowing is not as preferred. It will leave a thatch on the ground that's gonna also hamper the movement of, of the birds. So I'm currently working and developing partnerships as a, uh, a new, uh, somebody else that started with Natural Resource Conservation Service here in Maryland recently, Daniel Lawson, that is really focused on helping uh, provide uh, technical assistance on this. We're working with Maryland DNR, Bob Long, and also Washington College, Dan Small, to uh, to put in some demonstration sites um, and assess some different um, types of approaches for establishing these types of uh, grasslands. So we're gonna do uh, a couple of demonstration sites here at the Y Research and Education Center at the Y Angus Farm. Um, we're going to try one area that's not grazed with a particular type of grassland mix. And we're also going to have an area we have an active livestock operation here. And we're going to try a forage focused grassland mix to try and match production agriculture with wildlife values. Um, so if anybody's interested in learning more about that, happy to dig more and I'll have my contact information at the end. But here's a picture of where we're going to be doing that. Uh, there is available funding for buffers and to implement and put in some of these uh, particular types of warm season grasslands uh, through the Natural Resource Conservation Service. Now, I will note there are, in terms of the forage and production systems, there are some benefits and there's some drawbacks. Uh, some of the benefits that this can actually work pretty well for a livestock production system, um, warm season grasses um, in majority of pastures here in Maryland are managed with cool season fescue. Um, so in the hottest uh, months of the year, in the midsummer, uh, they have what's called a, a slump, a forage slump, where those um, grasses go dormant. It's just too hot for them to grow. So one benefit is by putting in warm season grasses, you can have, they'll actually be producing during those months when the fescue is. Um, they're perennials, so they're long lived and they don't require a lot of maintenance and they also require fewer inputs. They're adapted to lower quality soils and more acidic and different types of um, environments. So there's some, there's some benefits to that for putting in some new warm season grasses, especially in uh, marginal cropland or marginal areas. There are drawbacks. They are a little bit tricky to establish and that's why we're gonna be doing, uh, working on this, uh, this demonstration site. We're gonna be establishing a couple this spring they need more careful management with labs, livestock. Um, the grazing uh, needs to be just watched a little bit more carefully. They can be grazed in the summer, um, but they do need to be taken off um, when the thatch is six to eight inches high, higher than what people tend to think with a full season grass. Um, and then they, of course, they go dormant in winter. So a lot of recommendations will say uh, to maybe move, you know, a quarter of one's pastures into this type of grassland that they can move livestock in there in the summer months and be able to move them back off. So in conclusions for this section, we have uh, big declines in grassland birds. Um, there's three main types of habitat that are really needed in close proximity. You have these nesting warm season grasses, you need some of these forbs and crops for the animals to move around in and to grow and the babies to grow up in. 
and shrubs and thorny brambles and hedgerows and for escape cover are all needed in pretty close proximity to each other to help support the tree. Um, and I'm I really am a big proponent of finding ways to match uh, production system agricultural systems with wildlife values. So um, I think there are some ways in which this could fit into a livestock production system and also produce um, provide some good. So with that, I want to say thank you. I uh, covered a lot. We've got about 18 minutes before the hour, so I'm happy to take some questions. Um, here's a link to the comments and suggestions that, the, um, that, I, that I put in your chat box earlier, and uh, you can take also this QR code to go there. Um, feel free to give me give me feedback. Let me know what you'd like more of, what you uh, would like less of, um, uh, anything else you might have recommendations on. With that, I will stop and uh, take some questions. So there's a chat pod and there's a Q and A pod that you can enter any questions into. Thank you, Jose from Lisbon, Portugal. I've been to Lisbon. It's a beautiful city. There was a question about maybe um, plant. Um, repellents for certain kinds of insects. I guess that's maybe more of an IPM. Yeah, I some people will consider insects a lot uh, wildlife. They are wild in our life, um, but I'm not a particular expert on managing uh, invertebrate populations. Uh, we do have several experts like Stanton Gill and I'm sure Shannon, you probably know a few others um, that can touch on Problem, invertebrate insect problems. Mm -hmm. All right. Any other questions for Luke? I, I'm not seeing any come through. It's so, better not to be in person with people because I feel like uh, in person presentations would be a long start of the conversation. No, it was great. It was really great, and I think um, I think the research that's coming up too on on crops and how to make everything. Um, how to benefit everyone, I think, really is very interesting. Cool. Well, we'll give people a, a, just a, a few more minutes. Um, at this point, I'm going to stop the recording. <laughs>